Um, so my name's Ollie. I'm here to talk about public Wi-Fi. Um, like I said, my name's Ollie. You can find me on anywhere that I want to be found on the internet at Ollie the Ninja. Um, for a day job, I'm a graduate security engineer at Zero, but um, this this talk's my own doing, and my opinions are my own. And if I get in trouble, it's my own fault. So I've been told. Um, so the reason this came about was. Um, sorry, we'll go back to that. So the reason this came about was um, I sort of used to have an interest in Wi-Fi. Um, when I was a high schooler, my mum had dial-up, and I wanted faster internet, so I took an interest in my neighbor's Wi-Fi. Um, then we got broadband at some point, and I stopped worrying about it, went to university, had other problems. Um, <laughs> bigger things to research. Um, and then earlier this year, I went overseas, and before I went overseas, I thought about you know, what as a security person, I was kind of concerned taking my laptop overseas using dodgy internet connections and what I should do to keep myself safe. Um, and then I decided before I went away that I would submit this talk as a way of making myself do it. Um, so here I am. Um, there's also some misinformation around. This is a, a quote from some VPN prov provider I found on the internet. Um, apparently, people can hack into public networks, though by definition being public, you don't really need to hack into them, you can just sort of connect. Um, <laughs> it's a public network. Um, and sneak into people's devices, sneaking being the technical term for it. So, there's a lot of misinformation out there, there's like YouTube videos of people talking about how, you know, um, people can basically steal all of the information on your phone if you so much connect to a public network. Um, so I wanted to sort of squash some of that. Um, what I'm talking about today is public Wi-Fi, things that you access at a coffee shop or an airport or at a conference. Hey, um, anyone notice the Wi-Fi isn't working? Yeah. Um, and using Wi-Fi, obviously, because when you're traveling and stuff and you want to you know, check your emails or tweet, um, it's what you do. Um, we're going to talk mainly about like, HTTP, browsing the web, maybe doing some emails. Pretty much going to ignore everything else. Um, and we're not going to talk about like Bluetooth or cellular or stuff like that because we could give a whole nother talk on that. And we're not going to talk about denial of service because if you walk into a cafe and their free Wi-Fi doesn't work, you're just not going to use it and it's not a big deal. Um, we're not going to talk about tracking because using metadata to track people is a whole nother subject as well. Um, and we're not going to talk about targeting individual because if you're targeting an individual, if you're a targeted individual, you have bigger concerns than public Wi-Fi. So. Um, also, I'm not really an expert on any of those things. In fact, I'm not really an expert on what I'm talking about. It's the imposter syndrome coming through. But <laughs> I googled enough, so I feel like I'm qualified to give a presentation about it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're basically going to go through the layers that are involved in a Wi-Fi connection. Um, each one builds on the previous one. So you know, if you secure one layer, in theory, you can't get to the layers above it. Um, it's a very high level overview. Um, so we'll start with physical stuff. Um, so when you connect to Wi-Fi, obviously it's going over radio waves. Um, so that's your sort of lowest level. And it starts there, basically. Um, so this year there were two sets of vulnerabilities released to do with Broadcom chipsets, which are the Wi-Fi chips in most mobile devices. And basically those vulnerabilities were to do with the chip, the part of the circuit that receives packets over the air, and that vulnerability worked even if you had your Wi-Fi turned off, but had the location services that use your Wi-Fi signals to like triangulate, try and get a better location, it would still work. Um, so at that level, you're pretty much screwed. Android, and like so, if you have a Nexus device or if you have an iOS device, you should be up to date. Everyone else, I would check which security patch you're up to. Um, basically, patch your stuff. Um, the next level is the actual physical security of the connection that you're talking across. So obviously if you're in a cafe or an airport or something, there's not going to be any password that you type in, you just hit connect and away you go. Um, some cafes will write the password on the, on the whiteboard, which doesn't help because then everyone else knows what the password is. All you have to do is walk in. Um, so that doesn't really protect you either. If you are using a secure connection, then WEP has been 
vulnerable for years and years. Um, and since I submitted this talk, the crack, the whole crack thing came out, and basically we can treat that as vulnerable as well. So I in theory, any internet connection, any Wi-Fi connection you're connecting to, you can basically assume that the, the wireless connection itself is unencrypted. That's basically where I'm going with this. Um, but our main objective is when you're on a public network anyway, so we're gonna assume that it's unencrypted. Moving up a little bit, oh, um, this was another one about crack. Um, Radio New Zealand said that basically you shouldn't use Wi-Fi anymore, which <laughs> was a misattribution of what Internet N NZ said. I think it was Internet NZ. Um, but let's face it, we're not gonna stop using Wi-Fi, right? Um, I'm certainly not using Ethernet for everything. So now we get up to wired equivalent. So basically once you're connected to that access point, you basically have the same level of connection as if you plugged your ethernet cable into the, access, like into the network switch. Um, so these things actually don't apply just to Wi-Fi, but also if you're connected via a physical cable to an internet connection. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that can be done at this level. You can misdirect someone using DNS if you respond faster to a n domain name query than the actual domain name server. They could send you to some malicious site. Um, you can do ARP spoofing or ARP catch poisoning, which is basically also redirecting traffic, but basically saying, hey, no, this IP address is over there, not over there. And then same result, you go to attacker's server rather than actual server. Um, there's like host separation and stuff, which a lot of the enterprise access points support, but that doesn't really help that much. Um, often it's also not configured properly. I've seen it where like if you're on the same access point, you can't talk to the other device, but if you're on a different access point, you can. So, yeah. um, and then there's the Yasuga attacks type thing, which is where you, when a device says, hey, I'm looking for CVD free Wi-Fi, you say, yeah, that's I'm that access point, and then they connect to you. Doesn't work so well anymore because vendors have started protecting against that. Um, but some easier stuff still works, like just setting up an access point with an SSID, like with a Wi-Fi name that you know people will have, like trade me free Wi-Fi, CBD free Wi-Fi, you know. Or you just set up one that looks good enough, like the name of the cafe you're sitting at with free Wi-Fi on the end, and people will just start connecting. Um, so you don't know whether you're actually connecting to the access point that's legitimate or not either. So you sort of just have to assume that at this level, there could be someone bad sitting in the middle and you don't know. So if we move up further, ah, oh yeah, okay. So basically it boils down to someone being able to sit in the middle. Sniffing your packets, injecting stuff, trying to get malware onto your computer, scanning your computer for open ports, whatever they can do on a network, right? Um, so network security really isn't going to help you at this point because you don't know enough about the network that you're connecting to to know whether it's secure or not. So what can they actually do? Um, so aside from what I've talked about, SSL strip. So once you've redirected the, your victim to a bad server, um, you can do things like SSL strip, which is trying to get them to connect to the, to think that the server doesn't support TLS or encryption at the HTTP layer. Um, you could pop up a dodgy captive portal. Um, you could just sit in the middle and see all the data they send and not do anything with it. Just capture it. See some credit card details flying by in plain text. I don't know. Um, or you could inject malicious code into a non-encrypted site that they go to and then use that to get to an encrypted site that they can get to. Um, the, the, the picture on the right is, so, eight weeks of being overseas, traveling through Auckland Airport, I was very tired, um, so I didn't manage to capture the right screenshot, but you'll notice at the top that this portal doesn't have encryption, it says not secure. Um, it also doesn't have the HTTPS, which you'd expect an encrypted connection to have. Um, and what I didn't capture was the other screen where you could use your credit card to buy additional data over a non-secure connection. And anyone in the airport, or anyone near you could 
you know, because it's not an encrypted Wi-Fi either, they could then see your credit card details by virtue of sitting next to you with a laptop. Um, so I contacted the airport because I didn't know how to contact the company at that point. Um, after three days of not hearing anything, they, the vendor got back to me. They were very worried. Um, they didn't actually implement it. The Auckland Airport has to implement it. They just provide the system. And it's fixed now. So you can buy internet <laughs> at Auckland Airport without having to worry about your credit card data being sniffed. Um, there's another thing about captive portals. I've got like hundreds of screenshots from my travels of different captive portals. They all ask you for an email address. And you have to like, you can tick the box that says, yeah, I want to know more about your business or something. Um, I think it'd be kind of dubious from a privacy point of view if you didn't encrypt that, especially in New Zealand. Um, but most of the time you can just, uh, they don't actually validate your email address. So think of that what you will. Unless you're in Sweden, apparently they send you, an S like you have to put in your cell phone number, they send you a text message. That way they know it's you and you have to put it in before you can get access. But everyone else just takes any email address and then lets you onto their Wi-Fi. So John Doe at example.org gets lots of emails on my behalf. <laughs> right, so how do you protect yourself? That's what you really want to know, right? How much time have I got? Um, protecting yourself, there's some really easy stuff you can do. Make sure your computer's up to date. Make sure your operating system has all the patches applied. Make sure your browser has all the patches applied. Um, turn file sharing off so that when you're sitting on the Wi-Fi, someone else can't go along and just you know, go into Windows Explorer. Oh, there's another computer. Hey, look, they've got their documents shared to the rest of the network. Um, clean out your known networks list. You can't do this on iPhone, I've been told, but everyone else should be able to remove access points you no longer want to access, like CBD free Wi-Fi. Um, set networks to public, so a lot of computers will pop up a box and say, is this network your home network or a corporate network or a public network? If you do the public network, it should turn off your file sharing and stuff for you, so problem solved. Um, and then there's a plugin you can use, browser plugin for Firefox and Chrome and Safari and a couple of them. Um, called HTTPS Everywhere, which just makes sure that you're on that HTTPS connection if the server supports it and remembers that even if the server isn't set up to tell your browser that, um, which helps you stay on an encrypted connection. Um, and use multi-factor wherever you can, like whether it's your Google Authenticator app or a UDP or whatever, just it's just one more security mechanism and it's so easy. Um, if you're a, oh, and don't, don't click this. Don't, just don't, I've seen people click through this far too quickly. Don't do it. Um, when you see warnings like that, they're there for a reason. Um, if you're slightly more advanced, you could use a VPN. Um, sometimes you have to pay for them. Tor might be an option, but, um, and make sure that all your traffic goes through your VPN. If you're sending your DNS over the local network and not through the VPN, then so an attacker can get you to talk to them on a local network and bypass the VPN. So make sure all your traffic's going through it. Um, and manually actually make sure your firewall's turned on. It's kind of tricky depending on what system you're on, which is why I put it in the like slightly more advanced section. Um, and if your master wizard level, I have nothing for you. You know more, much more than me about this stuff. Um, finally, if, you're, uh, if you look after a website of any kind, make sure you have TLS, make sure it's working, uh, make sure you redirect people to TLS and don't let them browse the unencrypted site. Um, add HST headers, basically that just tells the browser, I have TLS, I will always want you to use TLS, don't ever go back to not using encryption. Um, provide multi-factor, provide it as a free add-on. Uh, MailChimp gives you a 10% discount if you have multi-factor enabled because it costs them so much less in customer support tickets. So, you know, provide an incentive for people to use multi-factor um, and use DNSSEC. It's kind of not that popular yet, but it's getting there, um, which is basically signing your DNS results so that someone can't imitate you, your DNS record. Um, that's, that's pretty much my talk. Um, there are some of my references. I just have one last thing to say. I decided this morning that I'd do a little demo. Um, I'm not actually going to show you anything. All I'm going to say is, ha hands up if you're connected to the um, B-Sides public Wi-Fi. 
Well, I know some of you are lying, because um, I've, I, so, and anyone notice that CBD free Wi-Fi isn't working? No? Um, so, I, I know that some of you are lying, because I had an access point in my bag for most of the day. Um, it doesn't go anywhere. It just has two SSIDs, B-sides and CBD free Wi-Fi. I've had 120 people connect to it so far. It's that easy to get your traffic to go somewhere else, so you need to make sure that your, what you're connecting to is encrypted. Thanks.